I'd like to have Michelle start off and explain what related to African American Civil War soldiers is going to be on view at the museum next year. Okay, thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, well, as uh, Eve mentioned, we have 11 exhibitions um, that will be part of the opening of the museum. And two of those especially will uh, feature uh, Civil War stories. Um, Slavery and Freedom is an exhibition that is part of a chronological narrative that is kind of the foundation, you know, as well as it being at the uh, lower level. Thank you. <laughs> the lower level of the, of the building. Um, so in those stories um, where in this exhibition, Slavery and Freedom, that will chronologically look at um, the, the, the from, from moving from Africa through the Middle Passage to um, the revolutionary uh, experience uh, and the Civil War and well into the 20th century, part of that story will, you'll see stories about African Americans um, who participated in the Civil War, those soldiers, and some images that you'll see at some point um, scrolling through here will include individuals um, that we've been able to collect through a variety of ways. Um, some of them have been through purchase, such as at um, Swan Auction Galleries or from individual dealers, but the bulk of our material has come through donations. Um, and I think an interesting part of the stories that the museum will be telling, um, sometimes in the exhibition, but also through the other ways that the museum will be telling stories, whether it's online, through publications, through supplemental media in the exhibition stories, would be the stories of donors as well. Uh, for instance, one of the um, pieces that we were able to collect um, through a donation is um, from a family whose ancestor had been the captain of um, the 20, the 25th Regiment, um, Captain Prickett, and he had a small souvenir album that holds the images of uh, 17 Civil War soldiers. And this had been held and treasured in the family um, um, for, for decades, for, for a, a century and a half. And by chance, the material, the information came to us and we began to discuss with the family the possibility of sharing that story more broadly with the world, and I think that those are important parts of not just telling, you know, what happened, what individual experiences were, but the meaning of that for just one family, and then being able to share that with the world, um, is is a moving moment. I think both for the visitors and then for the families who get to become a part of a history in the story, um, because certainly giving up a family treasure is um, is a unique. Um, thing to do. Not everybody can do it. Mm -hmm. And so the generosity of, of folks like that is important to our stories. Um, other images include, um, or other types of images will all, of Civil War soldiers will also be in the military gallery on another floor in the, ex in the museum exhibitions will be stories that look at the experience of African Americans in uh, wars since the, the revolution. Um, well into uh, the present, the war on terror, so we've collected in that area as well. Um, and some of those Civil War images as well as materials will be on display. So you'll see it in multiple places, um, not only those two galleries, but especially in those two galleries. Julie, can you tell us how this all came about? What were you looking for? What did you think was out there and what turned out not to be out there? Sure. So. Um, as you said, we just opened an exhibition called Personal Correspondence, and the, the idea behind this was to highlight and showcase our incredible collection of Civil War letters between family members and photography um, of soldiers and by soldiers. Um, to take a, an intimate look at the experience of the Civil War, to sort of take it down from the epic themes that it's often associated with, and really give a sense of the texture of that experience and what it's like on an everyday level. But knowing what I knew about not just our, our archives, but archives in general, I was nervous that we weren't going to be able to accurately represent the breadth and diversity of people who actually experienced and fought in the Civil War from Brooklyn. About 180,000 soldier, black soldiers fought during the Civil War. We don't have an exact number of how many black Brooklynites fought, but about 30,000 Brooklynites writ large fought in the Civil War. 
So when we went into the archives and began sifting through the letters, my suspicions were proved true. And I was unable to find any letters between an African-American soldier from Brooklyn and their loved one at home at all in our archives. So then I spread my wings a little bit further and I set out across the city to look in repositories across the city and was unable to find any letters in the New York City region and archives between an African-American soldier and their loved one. I was lucky enough through some diligent searching to find a pretty an amazing letter, um, nowhere in, near New York at Duke University Special Collections down in South Carolina um, between a Connecticut man fighting in the 54th Massachusetts, um, writing to a woman in Brooklyn, on Carroll Street in Brooklyn, actually. Um, Edgar Dinsmore um, was writing to a young woman named Carrie Drayton, and he actually had never met her in person. He put an ad in the Anglo-African newspaper and was searching for a correspondent, and she responded. And you only see it from his perspective, because we don't have her letters, but he makes incredible observations about about um, the connections between his own fighting and African-American citizenship, his sort of cautious hopefulness about the future, and I've been able to find no evidence about whether or not they actually met, but it does appear that he survived the war. But what this sort of pushed me to face was the power dynamics of the archive, because there are a lot of voices in the archive, in our archives, and archives across the country, across the world, but there are a lot of voices missing. And how do you curate a silence? That was the challenge that I had to face. And so what we ended up doing is building the archives and building that silence into the story that we tell upstairs. So everywhere we look, we are not just thinking about the voices that we can hear, but we are highlighting why we don't have the voices of everybody in our archives, and why we don't have the faces of everybody in our archives. And so one of the things that you'll see in the exhibition if you go upstairs is a really beautiful installation of about 136 cartes de visite, which are small paper portraits. Out of that 136, you'll only see one African-American face. It was the only black face in our carte de visite collection upstairs. Um, and we don't even know who he is. And to me, he's the most important face in there because he is representing that very tiny silence um, in our archives. And how many photographs did you think survived of Frederick Douglass when you went out on your hunt, Zoe? We, we just had an instinct that he um, was widely photographed, that he was probably the most photographed American of the 19th century, and um, we were on a quest to beat Lincoln and Whitman and General Custer was the big one to beat actually there's 155 of him um, and there's just about 30 35 photographs of Douglas that everyone uses you know the ones that appear on book covers and people um, print them and you can find them on Google Images but Douglas also wrote more about photography than any other 19th century intellectual and he was he was committed to being photographed wherever he went on on his um, book tours and his um, sort of lecture circuit so we just thought perhaps, you know, perhaps if we look hard enough, um, we'll find more. Perhaps, perhaps there's hidden Douglas, hidden silences around Douglas out there. So it was just a five-year quest, really, um, going through museum storage units and historical society archives and private collections and, you know, auction houses, um, and then eventually finding 164 photographs of Douglas, so making him the most photographed American by the time of his death in 1895. He would be the most photographed American in the world were it not for, would be the most photographed person in the world was it not for the British royal family. <laughs> the prince and the princess of Wales had 600 photographs taken each. So that, that they, you know, I can't, he can't beat that. And how many did you think were out there, Ron, when you set out on your quest? What were the strangest places that material turned up? Um, a, lot, uh, a lot of the photographs in the book came from collectors and dealers. Um, there's a vibrant collecting community in the country um, that is, uh, began to give rise um, maybe in the 1950s and the 1960s as we were approaching the centennial of the war. Um, photographs at that time were not a collectible. Um, the collectible items were the guns, uh, the swords, the uniforms. 
and uh, it, wasn't, it was fairly common for the dealer to sell a musket, for example, and say, well, here's a photograph of a soldier holding a musket that looks like the one that you just bought. <laughs> so it was a giveaway. Um, and that, that uh, began, uh, an appreciation began for the photographs themselves. Uh, in the 1970s, uh, you could probably buy them for a dollar, two dollars. Um, and uh, they've rapidly grown in interest and become a collectible all their own um, with prices that are um, very competitive with all the other collectibles in the Civil War world. Um, so most of the photographs in the book, and there's 77 altogether, my goal um, was to find original identified wartime photographs of African American soldiers. I quickly expanded that early on when I had uh, sort of an a duh moment, realizing that um, enlistments didn't begin until 1863. Um, and I began running into uh, a number of men um, who uh, were servants or, or who had served in some other capacity. So I thought, well, we should also include um, participants who uh, were men of color, um, but perhaps may have wanted to enlist but couldn't. Um, and for example, one of the slides you'll, or one of the images you'll see up here is Robert Holloway. Um, he was uh, the servant or manservant or bodyguard. There's a number of terms, phrases that were used. And um, he was with Major General Ambrose Burnside, who was well known for his, the play on his sideburns. Uh, we know that word today. It comes from Ambrose Burnside. He was not one of the best um, Union generals, um, but Robert Holloway and he were together since 1850 um, out in the West. How Robert Holloway got out of slavery and into the West, I'm not exactly sure, but their story picks up in 1850. Holloway was captured uh, at Bull Run, the first battle of Bull Run. Um, he was with uh, Burnside, not as an enlisted man, but as a servant, I thought that his story should be told. Burnside negotiated his release, uh, and there's a couple of documents in the official records um, of the War of the Rebellion um, that talk about that. So that's just one example of the, and that was in the Rhode Island Historical Society in a large scrapbook, and uh, it took my breath away when I saw it. <laughs> <laughs> because it said on it, Burnside's servant, Robert Holloway. So. I, my first question for Wyatt is, can I write your biography someday, right? Because you've been everywhere, and you've been told I'm, the stuff doesn't exist, and then, then you get the phone call. I'm, I'm trying. <laughs> so what's turned up even in the last year or two that you didn't, oh think, would ever, you didn't think you'd ever find? Well, um, there's always... A, what I do, there's always a surprise, because uh, just of the nature of a call for consignment at an auction house. You can imagine that I get calls from everything from dolls to muskets to whatever. But uh, in terms of really, really interesting things, in the last sale, which was just this last March, I had a Koran, and the Koran was a manuscript Koran, handwritten Koran <clears throat> from Timbuktu. There really is such a place. and. The, the thing about Timbuktu is that there were at least a half a dozen universities in Timbuktu. And these universities were at work like, like Christian monks who constantly copying the liturgy. Uh, so it was with, uh, with Timbuktu, but not just religious tracts, but astronomy, science, everything. Now, the reason this is so important is that had this been known, well it was known, but had, had this been available to abolitionists, um, the proof that Africans had a culture, the key argument from pro-slavery people was, well after all, these are sort of people, but they don't really have a culture, so therefore it's okay for us to enslave them. <clears throat> well the fact is that uh, when there were no real universities in Europe in the 10th, 11th, 12th century. There were, there were universities in Timbuktu. And so to have a Koran from one of the big libraries in Timbuktu in my last sale was a thrill. I contacted some Islamic scholars. We managed to 
get a handle on how this was written, what the suras were all about, the chapters. And it was bought by um, someone in the Middle East. I can't, I, it was an agent from Qatar that <laughs> bought it. And so um, it's not always, for what I do, it's not always as fortunate. You know, we try to, I try, if I have something in my sale that I think belongs somewhere regionally or with a specific institution, I let them know. I give them plenty of warning because I can't control the sale, but as Michelle knows, I try to get her advanced copies of my catalogs <laughs> as I do for other institutions as well so that this material which I should backtrack and, and give some backtrack on this. About 20 years ago, I'm a collector. About 20 years ago, it dawned on me that there was no real venue for hardcore African-American history. There was plenty of venue for so-called black memorabilia, which was this minuscule part of history and just black seen through a white prism. And so I put together a prospectus for us, what a sale might be like for an auction house, and I shopped it. And Swan was the only house that was receptive. Um, I was surprised that a very large auction house said to me that they liked the idea, but they didn't think there was enough market for it, which was astonishing to me. In any case, the, uh, the first sale in 1996 carried a manuscript from a slave from Senegal who was uh, in North Carolina named Omar Ibn Said. And he wrote his own narrative. Now we don't really have any slave narratives, manuscript, or not many. I've looked at a few smallish kind of diaries. But this is a genuine slave narrative. He tells how he was captured and his indignance, he was, he was on a plantation and he, he bolted, of course, and he was put in the jail. And he was, the jails in the South, a lot of them were outdoors, like the photographs some of you may have seen of the slave pens in Alexandria. And so he grabbed a rock or something and scratched in Arabic, something to the effect of help, and the brother of the governor of North Carolina who was uh, visiting or something passed by and saw it. And they, the family gave him special dispensation. He didn't have to work, but they didn't free him either. But he was allowed to write and, and communicate with people. All of this is by way of saying, this sale has become a conduit for this kind of material. I am proud to say, and a lot of it has gone to the museum in, in D.C. So are you getting versions of the, I guess, um, my general question for the panel, do we have cases where we have a white soldier's version of the same battle that we have a black narrative of that's quite I'm different? Does that come up? I'm sure there must be. I mean, Michelle, I, do you have I have the letter from Morgan Carter, <coughs> which was uh, two years or three years back, it was an extraordinary long letter, described known, several known battles that he was in. So there must be mm -hmm. uh, versions by white uh, Did, did that turn up or, for you, Ron, in the course uh, of your uh, yes, uh, yes, there were some narratives that turned up. Um, in, in a source uh, that I used uh, at the National Archives in Washington, DC, uh, the soldiers had pension files um, and they also have military service records. Military service records, um, it's mostly a monthly report of what that soldier was doing, good and bad. Um, and then the pension files uh, are much more personal records because they are, um, they or their widow or their children or some family member is attempting to secure a pension on behalf of their veteran. And um, when I first began um, the project and started filing for the pension records, the National Archives would deliver two big folders. 
And that was dramatically different from my experience with uh, documenting white soldiers. I usually got one envelope. So my first thought was some sort of mistake. But the National Archives doesn't make a lot of mistakes. <laughs> They're really good about uh, delivering the files. And um, what I came to find out is um, in, in a number of cases, not all, but a number of cases, special investigators um, were sent out because these men and their families couldn't prove many of their basic um, facts of their lives, their birth dates, their marriage dates, the births of their children, their residents. And imagine you're going to the federal government and asking them for money, um, and you cannot answer the basic questions. Yeah. So um, uh, I, I haven't, I can't say if the government was consistent in sending these special mm -hmm. investigators out, but in a large number of cases, they were sent to Mississippi, to Tennessee, um, to the plantations, the former plantations. Uh, and some of the letters, some of the, they're really affidavits, um, they're interviews. And um, in some cases, they're quite brutal to read because they're the plantation owners or former plantation owners are honestly saying that they owned a human being. Um, and the freedmen are saying, I was owned by so-and-so. But also within those, you do read accounts where they're describing how they were wounded, how they were injured, and that becomes uh, a narrative of their war experience. They vary in the depth and the breadth, but you do get some sense um, from those documents. Wow. Yeah. And Michelle, there's, it's going to be powerful, right, your Civil War section. Right? You could yeah. just show glory. So someone wrote me when they RSVP'd that they want to come to this program that all they have to do is watch the footage of the 54th Massachusetts and they weep every time so they right. couldn't wait to come tonight. How are you going to accommodate visitor reactions at the museum? You mean dealing with the emotions of yeah, the moment? Yeah, um, the, particularly the Civil War. Right, yeah. particularly the Civil War. Well, I think even, you know, certainly just talking about it, the, the, the process of an experience of enslavement is, is going to be its its own um, issues to, to deal with. And I think the space is done in such a way that people can step away and, and have quiet moments. And then there is a separate um, area in the museum. It's called, I believe, the Contemplative Court, where there's a, a water place. So you can just come and, and relax. There's going to be um, a lot of stories um, um, from the Civil War enslavement uh, well into the 20th century that deal with uh, the difficult issues that certainly not shied away from um, in, the, in the museum. Um, at the same time, it, it's balanced with, um, you know, telling triumphal stories. Um, some of the images of the Civil War soldiers that we're looking at, some of them are stories of people who survived and went on to live a long life. Sometimes you find it quite surprising. Um, and in other times, it'll be very sad because that person would have died, um, you know, shortly after the, the photograph was taken. Um, I know. And what have been the reactions to the show, Julie, so far? Because that's intense too, yeah. Yeah, I think something that Michelle is getting at is that there's a real intimacy in interacting with people's things and people's stories and people's faces and people's handwriting. It can be really powerful, it can be really empathy building. Um, and, and, um, yeah, and it can challenge your preconceived notions, I think, in, in really important ways. So all that to say that the, the reaction has been quite positive, and I think um, one of the things that's been important for us is to draw themes between people's war experiences in the 19th century and people's war experiences today, to draw experiences between the way we communicate with our loved ones today and the idea of communicating via a handwritten letter or an image in the 19th century, and I think that's something with that, you know, particularly young people are very unfamiliar with um, the idea of writing a letter to somebody and the, the intimacy of that. To that end, we have created a, a place where people can actually write a letter in the in the exhibition to somebody that they've encountered in the Civil War. And I'm not surprised, but I'm glad to see a lot of letters written to Edgar Dinsmore, whose whose story is is really personal and really powerful. Do you, do you find descendants? I mean, I wonder if we could find descendants out there. Um, of Dinsmore specifically, yeah. I have hit dead ends with both Dinsmore and Carrie Drayen, mm. unfortunately. So I don't even know if they met. 
Mm -hmm. um, it's pretty clear that he survived. His last letter is dated June of 65, so it's pretty clear that he had survived the war. Um, but it, the great thing about watching his letters over time, and this is the nice thing about not a single letter, but a collection of letters over time and watching a relationship develop over time, is you see them getting into each other. <laughs> the, the 19th century sort of chaste courtship grow and they switch from using last names to first names and they dream of meeting each other. So again, this kind of, you can, there's a universality in the humanity of the way that somebody writes an intimate letter to each other. And particularly with the thousands of school children that we get here, having a letter like that, I think sort of demystifies his, the, the, his, this history and makes it really tangible and really personal. Mm -hmm. We think that there were a handful of black soldiers on the Confederate side, Ron, is that right? What uh, are we, there's, I, this I, is a dicey I, I issue, yeah, right? I, I, I've never, I've not been able to find a photograph. There's no visual evidence yeah. that I was I able to find. it's largely that. apocryphal. Was, uh, so, Wyatt, it's mostly apocryphal? Or what's the largely, current state I of mean, scholarship on there, that? There were a great many slaves that were drafted into working battlements and so forth, and I've, <clears throat> I've handled a number of claims from plantation owners for slaves that were killed. Um, uh, it's it's hard to say, you know, if, if there were, because relationships were close in some cases where you right. had servants who were really close to their masters and went as kind of aide de camp with them. I know personally of a family where the uh, uh, years ago, I, met a, uh, I was asked to do an appraisal of a bunch of black memorabilia, actually, and went down to Virginia, and um, the, the gentleman, had, the house was filled with this stuff, a bunch of Ima cookies, jars, and all of that. And the man who had introduced me said, oh, you really ought to talk to uh, Blanche. And I, I thought, I'm... I've done it again. Collectors really get into this thing where you're completely avoiding talking to the, the man's wife. So it wasn't that at all. He said, Blanche's father was a slave. And I'm thinking, this, this is 2002. Yeah. Yeah. Blanche's father was a slave. Well, she was born when he was 68 or something. But he went in the, he was the aide to his master. They went down the coast to South Carolina which fell immediately. I mean, it was one of the earliest places to fall. And his master sent him home with $100 and said, you know, go take care of mistress. On the way, he was mugged by Union soldiers who stole the money. And so I had all this firsthand from a diary that, mm -hmm. that the, uh, the father had kept. And uh, he, he he lasted till something like 97 or something like that, very, and very vital right to the end. He was a bailiff to the court in, uh, in Nor Norfolk. But uh, as I'm saying that it's hard to say if, if you're there and someone's firing on you and there's a musket laying on the ground, if you're not gonna pick it up and right. fight. Right. So I think a lot of the stories about black Confederate soldiers lie somewhere in this kind of nether world. Uh, are you, are you gonna, is the museum going to have room to tell that story, that complicated? Well, we haven't come across um, the materials like um, have no. been described, and, and as, as Ron indicated, that that is an area where historians and um, enthusiasts and collectors have a lot of debate and discussion about. Mm -hmm. and. Um, you know, what we try to do in the museum is navigate between um, telling the most important stories and being able to tell them with the material objects as well. So um, I'm not aware of no. telling a particular story about a soldier who served in the Confederacy. I have to say, I, I find this a really, I find it fascinating that people want to people are so interested in this question. People are very, very committed to debating this when it seems like the debate is probably about maybe a couple hundred people. Um, and I think that what it indicates is that there's so much power in myth. Um, whether this was real or whether this was myth, it's almost not about whether those people fought, it's about what it has come to represent 
over time. And for a very conservative sort of group of people, this is this sort of hard line evidence that you can hold on to that complicates this sometimes black and white story about the North and the South, which is really just so much more complicated. But there is a, actually a wonderful post recently on Slate.com. Slate's running this fantastic series about the history of slavery on their podcast right now, which I would highly recommend. Um, and there's a really wonderful post today on Slate, um, seven myths about slavery and a little bit of history on each of the myths. And it's funny because those myths are often less about the Civil War and more about what happened after the Civil War. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, if I could just add though, I mean, I think what, what um, Wyatt and Julia were also pointing out is that it's, it's not you know, one or the other you know, type of story. And we do, we do also collect and present those stories. We did collect an image of a woman who, and I believe the picture was taken uh, post-Civil War when she had been freed. And I'm sorry, I don't recall her name and it's, it's not included here, but um, we did collect um, a story of a woman who had been enslaved um, by the family and was, had been raised actually since she was a child there, had been raised and served as a servant with the family. And after um, emancipation, she continued to stay with the family as a servant. She in fact died there and was buried on the thing. You know, so there's, you know, these were, intimate experiences that, that yeah. people had, and it's part of the story and the experience as well that yeah. would be told. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I would love to hear questions. Um, there's a microphone that they can bring to you if you raise your hand, please. I, we've got hey, <laughs> <laughs> I have a loud voice, so I can. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, thank you all for being here. It's a great subject, and I'm sort of looking at you and looking at the photos <laughs> at the same time. Um, I, and I know this is about yeah. photos, but I'm very curious because you've mentioned the silence, which I think we're all aware of. And sort of, I'm curious, you know, looking at these human beings to know something maybe about the fami family oral narratives that are filling out stories, if they are, and how those might be viewed in, in terms of sort of scholarly history, or whatever, and sort of whether or not um, there were organizations or any kind of societies that were involved with soldiers. For instance, you said, you know, soldiers had to apply for pensions, and I'm assuming that many of them could not write or fill out an application of some kind. So there must have been entities or people that assisted with this. And whether or not there's any written uh, record in, in that sort of context or sort of newspapers where one might find accounts or, or photographs. Uh, you know, because these, these individuals are coming alive in, in what you're doing. So we have a piece, we know what they look like, and then we kind of add on from there. Yeah. I was at, uh, um, one, of, one of the great challenges for me has, uh, because my work begins with finding the photograph, uh, that doesn't mean I'm going to find anything um, about the individual. I'm hopeful to, and I check out all the resources um, to try to find, um, find information. But it tends to be very uneven. Um, sometimes I'll have a pension file that has got a ton of information. Um, I might find uh, one of the vibrant African-American newspapers of the period that's got some information about the regiment. Um, the soldier might be mentioned in orders. And I'm, I'm, I feel like I'm something of a detective trying to piece together their life and try to make some sense of it. And occasionally um, having an interaction with family members, um, sometimes there's a story there, sometimes there's not. Um, so I, I found it all to be very variable. And I think on some level it makes sense because none of these objects, none of these images and letters, they were never meant for us to be looking at them right now. Um, that's, and I think that partly speaks to your point earlier about they're very intimate. These are, they're so intimate and you're so drawn in by them. Um, I, and it's only in recent years, I think, that they're becoming more a part um, of, of our formal record or evolving in some direction. Um, I think that there's still a lot of stuff out there that's left to be found. 
Um, and I hope that the puzzle pieces will come together more to give us a clearer picture. What I find uh -huh. fascinating is how much access a black soldier would have had to photography. And we don't have, I don't know if we have any other narrative except Frederick Douglass talking about the thrill of being photographed. Yes, and, and just to build on what Ron was saying, but also disagree on the one point about these not being intended for us, you know, yeah, I think you're completely right, with the exception of Douglas. He yes. knew he was he's <laughs> sort of an interesting uh, counterpoint within this, actually, because when we were looking for him, you know, even with Douglas, he's still, um, you know, we would find just um, his image in uncatalogued, in cardboard boxes, sometimes labeled unidentified Negro. Um, and so I can, you know, only imagine when you're not dealing with the world's first black celebrity, just right. how hard yes. um, and how... Um, how many pieces there are missing about, about these stories. Um, but, you know, and this is from someone who took great care to create his own legacy, who, who disseminated these photographs really widely, who wanted them to be engraved, would gift them to people, would use them as an incentive to subscribe to his newspapers, um, would send them around the world to pe and, and ensure that people had them hanging in their homes and in their photograph albums. You know, he had an eye on, on us. You know, he hoped we would be collecting these. And, and so if even they have had vanished for the best part of a, a century, um, you know, it says something, I think, about the neglect of um, Af the African-American archive, um, you know, in the 19th and 20th centuries, definitely. And I have found some unpublished manuscripts where families have written down information. Um, and then there are some more formal ones. Uh, one of the soldiers up here is Alexander Heritage Newton. He was with the 29th Connecticut Infantry. Um, I think it was 1902, he wrote his autobiography um, called Out of the Briars. And he tells his story. And if you, uh, it moved me dramatically and to tears on several occasions as he talks about his experience um, and does it so well. I think he's very mindful um, of his legacy mm -hmm. and the legacy of his race. He goes back and visits that over and over again as the reason why he became involved in the war. He's not a name that anyone knows, um, but he speaks, un, uh, he speaks so eloquently um, from 1902 that it feels like, I feel like he's sitting next to me right now when I read his words. There, there are a number of, <coughs> of narratives, and sort of looking at this in reverse, because a number of narratives that I've handled and examined by people were not noted. I mean, they're little privately printed narratives of, of somebody who, who was a, a veteran of the Civil War and an escaped slave. I've, I've got one that's going to be in my next catalog uh, by a man by the name of Sam Alexson and uh, probably a play on Sam, uh, Sam Alex, you know, or, or whatever, Sam Alex is it, or mm -hmm. something like that, some and then, exp uh, derogatory name. But there's a photograph, I mean, there's a frontispiece from a photograph, and there, there are a number of narratives like this that, that tell the experience, and there's a picture there. Um, some cases, perhaps more than one. I've, I've seen one where there's a, a picture of family members and you get a, a picture of the experience, the runaway slave, the war experience, and then and the peace experience afterwards, which is often more and more exciting. And then the WPA sent out interviewers, fanned out all over the South, and those are, correct me if I'm wrong, some of those are reliable and some of those aren't. Well, right? I think that like all sources, you have to mm -hmm. take them with a grain yeah. of salt, and it's about what information you can pull together. And I think um, the experience with our museum is that, um, you know, oral histories and family lore have been a very important part of, of um, the decision to, to um, identify and, and take on material. Um, can we um, document that in official, you know, historic sources? Sometimes you can, sometimes you can't. Sometimes information is conflicting. And I think the key is to explain what you have and what you do know. You know, does, just because it's not definitive doesn't mean it's not worth telling. Mm -hmm. I think we have a question here and then another one up in the front. I have a, a couple of questions. Perhaps I, I missed it. Is it known exactly uh, how many black soldiers uh, were in the army and, uh, as per year or as per state? Is, is that, that is known? known, right? It is it's known that uh, generally I think it's about 180,000. Yeah, 180, uh, it's 165 
regiments or organizations um, composed of about eight, 180,000 soldiers. And then about um, 18,000 to 20,000 sailors. Um, the Navy was, was by contrast, um, somewhat more integrated. Um, so uh, there is a healthy population in the Navy, which was never quite large, maybe um, I think 100,000 enlistments um, during the course of the war. Oh, but it wasn't a segregated, mm. they weren't segregated. Oh, well, it was, it was similar or, to the or, Army and, uh, from the respect of having white officers. Mm -hmm. um, uh, but you're on a ship together, um, and there were more African Americans in the Navy, I believe, earlier um, than mm -hmm. in, the, in the Army. That's so. about 10% of the Union Army. Yeah. Yeah. Did, did they enter combat? And how many of those, that's a considerable number of men. Were they in combat? All of them. Basically. All of them in, not, in not actual all. combat? Some, some units never saw action, but uh, there, there are a considerable number that did. But I, it just depends. Some, even today, you have units that, that are construction units. And, and so you had and, that. And I think combat is a term that you have to define a little bit. Um, you can talk about um, Fort Wagner, you can talk about Holly Hill, you can talk about Olusti, um, mm -hmm. you can talk about Newmarket Heights. Um, there's a number of uh, battles or parts of battles where uh, U.S. colored uh, regiments performed um, and faced um, the consequences of being in the line of, of lead um, of bullets. Um, uh, but there's also regiments that that weren't in those battles. Um, they're also on very garrisons of small towns in Louisiana and Mississippi. Um, and they're going out on patrols. And that's, that's dangerous stuff um, when you're out um, doing that kind of business. So it, to me, um, when I, I get a little uh, concerned about the whole combat question because these men, many of these men were in combat zones and they may not have been in the big battles, but they were facing some of the same um, uh, tensions, the same pressures that come with being um, in a war zone. It may be naive on my part, but were they integrated or what degree of integration uh, did they have with the uh, white soldiers? Well, or were they all in separated groups? Uh, well, the regiments were, se were separate. There were separate regiments, separate organizations officered um, by white men. Um, I believe there's one estimate I read. It was about 120 um, men of color that became officers. Uh, many of those are chaplains. Um, some are surgeons. Um, there is a few um, that were um, uh, what you might call line officers, lieutenants. And, um, and those are very, very late, March and April maybe even May after the surrender um, where those happen. And of course, some brevets, uh, as Wyatt points out as well. I'd like to know, um, African Americans used to record in their Bibles when the children were born, who went to war, um, what took place. There was a lot of history in Bibles. Have the museum collected any of those Bibles for African-American um, history? Yeah. Um, yes, we've seen them. Um, we've done a program called Saving Our African-American Treasures um, where we go to different cities and people can bring their materials and um, sometimes we've seen several uh, uh, Bibles like that um, and then conservators can tell them how to take care of it. We've collected at least one. Um, as you can imagine, those are treasure, family treasures and, you know, what we're, while we might ask, people might not say yes, and other times, you know, we feel almost like, well, no, that's your, your treasure, and we can't collect all of them, you know, um, the, there, there might be different uh, reasons to, coll to collect something besides the willingness to give it to the, muse give it to the museum, um, but certainly as an example to demonstrate where um, records um, would not have existed or had been destroyed, where there would have been records that th those family records um, were kept and that can help with uh, genealogy. Part of the museum will have um, a genealogy place where people can learn about that as well. We've had, um, I 
handled uh, numerous, numerous Bibles that were plantation Bibles. They belonged to the, uh, to the plantation master, were accurate records of the birth and, uh, and death and illness of slaves were kept very carefully. Um, and I, a lot of Bibles, family Bibles, you find uh, between the Old and New Testament, there was a, a number of pages that where one can, these were printed this way, where one could fill in. Mm -hmm. And that's usually where you'd find these, these records. Interestingly enough, I had one where the white births and the black births were all on the same pages. They, they were all noted. Whereas in other instances that I've seen this, it's usually on the fly leaves where the slaves were noted, the births and deaths, whereas the family would be in, the, in between the, the Old and New Testament. But those are certainly great, great boon question. to genealogy because you can see the, the family connections. Right, I think the Virginia Historical Society is one of many places that's gathering yeah, the, up databases of that's names. Right, the big database. right, as best we can, right, with misspellings and as best we can sift through them, right, to find patterns and, and look for the same person when she got a last name after the Civil mm -hmm. War. Yeah. Hello, thank you for an interesting panel discussion. Um, I was doing genealogical research on my family and I found out that my great-great-grandfather fought in the Civil War. His name was Arthur Beasley. I found it when I, um, on the Smithsonian website. It was actually um, uh, his uh, pension, the widow's, widow's pension fund. There was a form film filled out for him. So I was wondering, if I went to the National Archives, would I be able to flesh out some you know, this person by finding documentation of his life there? Is that what you were saying? If you fill out a form. Oh. <laughs> okay, don't let me in as just a lay person, not a historian. Yeah. No, or... no, uh, it, it, it's really simple. Uh, as an American, you're entitled to see those records and uh, go to Washington. You really do, you fill out a very simple form. They will help you. Uh, and um, within an hour, uh, they'll deliver to you the files. Um, if you, if you are fortunate, you've got the double folder that I described earlier. Um, sometimes the contents um, uh, of, of what you'll find inside can be amazing. Um, I have found photographs inside uh, those pension files before, um, and the archives is trying to collect those so that they keep them um, safe and separate. Um, uh, and other writings, all kinds of personal writings, all the affidavits I mentioned earlier. So I would urge you strongly to go down there and check it out. Um, and also um, ask for his military service record too. You can also get some of this online, um, uh, fold3.com, uh, F-O-L-D-3, which is owned by Ancestry. Um, they've got, they're very active in putting the pension files and the military service files uh, online, digitizing everything. We have sure. two, Good more, luck. two more questions on this side. I was going to say, similar to what she said, um, that I was just in South Carolina and I uh, found information about my great-great-grandfather who was in the Civil War Company, uh, Infantry uh, 34 um, mm -hmm. Colored Troop. Um, and I was going to ask some of the same questions, but one of the things I would like to know, the, uh, fem the child with uh, Frederick Douglass, is that from his first wife or if you know? Or from yes, his yes, it's, it's his youngest daughter, Annie, um, and she, she actually died about five years mm -hmm. after this photograph was taken. Um, if you see it come through, it, it's the photograph of Douglas with the little girl. Um, and he was devastated. She died while he was in England fleeing after the John Brown raid. People wanted to arrest him, and he managed to get out of Philadelphia, um, where he was giving a talk uh, with the help of a photographer, actually. Um, helped him get out to Rochester, Canada, England. And while he was there, Annie Douglas, his youngest uh, daughter, died. Um, and so finding this photograph, I, it was an incredibly moving experience because for the first time we have Douglas, the father. You know, there are no photographs of him with his children um, at all. And for the first time we have Annie Douglas. There are no other photographs at all of Annie. The other four children lived into adulthood. They were photographed in the 20th century. So we have pictures of them with their own children. Um, so to find this, where you can see he's got his arm around her, just holding a little doll. Um, just, 
just one of the most amazing things to find. But yes, that's with his first wife, that's with Anna, as were all his children. Um, he didn't marry Helen until quite late in life. Yeah. There are no photographs, unfortunately, that we've found of him with Anna, his first wife, and two or three with Helen, his second wife. Yeah, um, very great panel. Um, it's a slightly complicated question, but it could be easy for you guys. Um, out of the African Americans that were like enslaved and the soldiers, you know, besides like even thinking about preserving their history, how many were literate and kind of understood exactly what was going on? Like, did they, like, were like 5% of the blacks actually understood there was a war and they understood the consequences and the blood that was being spilled, or maybe 2% really understood, but you know, when they got free, most of them didn't. They just knew they were free. So how much of that, of the African Americans were literate? And then, um, you know, we hear stories about even the, the Southern people who fought in the Civil War. Many people who died on the white side were, were literate as well. They just had to fight. So out of that, just um, if you can maybe explain who was literate and who was not. And, and I know obviously collecting stuff from someone who doesn't understand. See, right. hard. Michelle, I don't know, how did news, how did news filter out to these, to the edges of the... Well, I think you find that um, in communities there is often a literate individual who has either taught himself or been taught and they share information. And I would say that um, even the illiterate um, slaves and, and, and not slaves um, were well aware about the Civil War and what it was about and what its consequences would be. In fact, the enlistment of soldiers, um, you know, that was um, that um, the anti-slavery element, and certainly Frederick Douglass was demanding that the Union take on and let African Americans fight was exactly for that reason. And um, while there was um, initially one regiment, I believe, that, that, that started out, it quickly had to spill over into more because there were so many volunteers and some of those men were literate and some of them weren't and the ones who were would quickly you know quickly move up and become you know leaders of the the different organizations within so i mean in terms of numbers I, that's not something i carry around in my head that i can tell you and certainly um maybe ron do you have any i, I don't know that i have any um hard and fast numbers to be able to share um other than the fact that <laughs> certainly a much smaller number of men were educated and knew how to read and write um, in my research, I did find several regiments where the officers were teaching um, the enlisted men to read um, and to write. And uh, it was interesting to see general orders that the colonel, the colonel's the commander of the regiment, um, would publish about uh, a contest for uh, being, having the best penmanship and getting a book or getting a gold pen um, and the company, on the company level, they would have these contests. Um, but in the same regiment, you would see other general orders where the colonel is admonishing the white lieutenants and captains to not beat the men with their swords um, because it reminds everyone of a time when they were slaves and in the spirit of the age, they shouldn't be doing that. So it's really curious um, mm -hmm. contrast going on. So you've got a regiment where they're trying to educate, but at the same time, you've got some real conflicts of emotion going on. And, and why you've handled many of the broadsides, right? The, an, ad that, an ad that would have been posted in the South to get colored troops to enlist, yes, right? Well, actually, there's, there's a very famous one. Um, we may have it going by here, mm -hmm. which is the uh, probably printed in Philadelphia, which shows the, the camp and uh, a number of soldiers uh, before a tent, I believe. And uh, interestingly enough, that and uh, a slightly larger version, where I, I thought until somewhat recently, a couple of years, a few years ago, that that was it. It turns out that a version of that about the size of a wall uh, exists, and uh, there may be, may be a couple of them that about six feet tall by eight or ten feet wide, 
that were posted up on a wall in places like Boston or Philadelphia um, to, to recruit troops. And, uh, and the text to, to that larger one was actually written by Frederick Douglass. We, we have a facsimile one. of that, actually. You have the real thing. Yeah. 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 <laughs> so you can go to DC or just upstairs yeah, and see the great. facsimile or both. <laughs> we have time for I've one more question. Surprised. Let's try. Let's, right? Hi, uh, my question is for Professor Todd. Uh, I've seen a fair number of Frederick Douglass images, uh, cabinet cards and CDVs and other uh, photos. I definitely haven't seen 164 mm. uh, like you have. Uh, but one of the things I noticed is that on the back, the advertisement is oftentimes for a local photography shop, and yet they seem very similar to others that come from the big companies back in the East. Did he license out his image and a lot of places simply copied it and sold it on their own? Which would suggest to me that his image is really spread a lot more widely than simply a single image. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it might have just actually been everywhere. Uh, and as a corollary to that, have you run across many of these images that were printed, say, from the 1850s, well, maybe the 1860s up to his death, were printed in the South? Mm -hmm. Or is it mostly in the North, in the sort of Northwest? It's a really great question. So just on the second point, um, we found probably 15 of the 164 were taken in the South and were for sale um, in the south and, and southerners could go buy them in the in the particular photography shop window. Um, they were all though after 1870 and a lot of them in the 1880s. Um, Nashville for example when, when Douglas would go speak there in the 1870s. Uh, on the first question to my knowledge, the backing of all the carte de visite and cabinet cards are of the local studios, and he would give permission to the photographers to make copies and sell more, so they, this wasn't just for him, he wasn't just going to purchase copies himself. Often though, if they agreed to give a portion of their profits to a particular cause that he might be interested in, so actually he goes through a phase in the late 1880s, early 1890s, where he's telling people they can sell his photograph if they give a, a portion to Booker T. Washington's Tuskegee Institute. He was sort of supporting that institute briefly. Um, so, the, you know, he, he's, he's making sure to sit with photographers wherever he goes, and, and he's often choosing to be photographed by women, by recent immigrants, and by African-American photographers. You know, he's not seeking out the, the Matthew Brady's and the Alexander Gardner's, the famous people. He's um, he's got his pick when he, whatever town he goes into, this is such a thriving um, business and America has such a love affair with, with photography that there are multiple studios he can choose from and he's, he's choosing interracial photography teams and um, he, he, reformers and former abolitionists who have now become photographers and underground railroad operatives who are also taking photographs. It's a really diverse group of people. Um, and he's making sure to sign the ones he likes the best. We found clusters from similar sittings where it's very clear um, he's straightening out his coat and making sure his hair is perfect and his tie is not, you know, skewed. Um, you know, and signing the one that's absolutely perfect. That'll be the one that shows up in a lot of archives. You know, get, that's the one he authorized to be circulated. The others you only ever see in one place. It's usually the photographer's own archive. You know, those are the ones Douglas didn't like. And then he would order a bunch of copies for himself, he would hand them out, he would give them away with his newspaper, and yet photographers could then sell them to the general public. And we have evidence of whenever he would show up to give a lecture, the photographer would manage to put the carte de visite on sale the next day, and people who had been to the lecture the night before could go buy the souvenir and keep it as, as a sort of souvenir of having seen Frederick Douglass. So he was very active, I guess, in this process, and, and would work with photographers closely, have favorite photographers, and just really try as hard as he could to get that image out there. And the, the other new book that I uh, wrote about a week or so ago, um, Sojourner Truth mm -hmm. sat for about 25 or 30 um, photo sittings, maybe half a dozen photographers. She sold hundreds of copies, hundreds and hundreds of copies for about 40 cents you could get, including postage, you could get a copy of, so it financed her life, it financed her speeches, it financed her her travel. So there's also a new book out about, and they're, they're stamped on the back and, and her, her tagline is, I sell the shadow to support the substance, meaning I sell this, this, this meaningless image of myself in order to finance my Crusades. One more question? One last question. One last question. There's a Beale family album 
on display here, and in it, it seems to include that horrible picture of the slave with a scarred back, mm. with some, where there's some relationship between him to be in that album, if, if that is indeed true. And what do you well, know about the Beale family? That, that album was something that was in um, my last <coughs> catalog, and it was a family album f uh, from a New England family, a Boston family, and it was common uh, after the advent of the, what we call the CDV, the carte de visite, those smallish photographs, it was common for people to collect them. And uh, in the case of that particular album, there were, I think, 17 photographs of, of generals. Um, there was a photograph of Private Gordon, as the one you're referring to, a man whose back was so terribly scarred. He was a runaway and he joined the Union troops, and then he was captured by Confederate troops who beat him nearly to death. That picture ran as an engraving in Harper's Magazine. I think we've got the image of both him uh, uh, as a photograph and, and in the Harper's Magazine, Harper's Weekly, which was uh, a periodical that virtually everybody got in the Civil War, during the Civil War. It was uh, the reporting, of constant daily day reporting of the war with lots of engravings. It was a pictorial publication. That's the, the, pretty much the only story there is. We don't really know anything more um, about Dewey, about, um, no, about, I mean, Gordon, about yeah. Private Gordon, I think. Yeah. We don't, and that's the interesting thing, that nobody bothered to ask him his name, nobody bothered to ask him his story, and it was pictures like that, actually, that Douglas and other abolitionists and, I think, black Civil War soldiers in posing in these uniforms and, and sending these images home to family were pushing back against these images of exposure, you know, of these available and wounded um, and half-naked black bodies. This is what Douglas was trying to reinvent by reinventing the first black public persona and doing that in a very experimental way during the Civil War when this photograph was being circulated. You know, the Civil War really pushes him to find a new that he stands up in photographs for the first time. You know, he starts to do his three-quarter statesman sort of visionary gaze in response um, to sometimes, you know, well-meaning but pretty, um, you know, inexcusable circulations by abolitionists of photographs uh, of Gordon scarred back. He wanted, you know, Douglas in never smiling, for example, until the very last few months of his life in a photograph makes himself completely unavailable. And that's in contrast to these, these images of exposure of the whipped backs, which not just Gordon, but across oh, abolitionist visual culture. So he's, he's, he's having a battle, basically, with that kind of image. Um, the Sojourner Truth book has a couple of examples of um, black people who bought her photograph, and it's turned up in their albums, but also white abolitionists, where in some cases, this the pictures of Sojourner Truth turned up in, in the albums of, of, and there is no other non-relative in the album. A white abolitionist had an entire album full of their own family photos, and then at the end is Sojourner Truth. They were such, they were such powerful icons for the people who owned them. One more question? Just a tiny one. Okay, okay, okay. And then we have to shut it down. Okay. <laughs> Uh, I was going to say after that beautiful question and answer, which is a very profound uh, question, mine's a kind of a teeny question, which is, have any of you seen photographs or were there reunions of these troops at all? Did they come together, yeah. stay together? They're, yeah, great oh, yes. photographs of those guys. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Ron? Uh, yeah, they are all over uh, the place. Regimental history books. Um, uh, start uh, coming out in the 1860s um, up until the early 1900s and you've got um, uh, attempts, there's reunions that are taking place um, that are recorded in those regimental histories. The, the reunions they're having are leading to them organizing committees to write these books and of course they're uh, also having monuments um, uh, erected in their honor at Gettysburg or Vicksburg, Chickamauga, um, other places. And so they'll go down there for the opening ceremony. So you'll see a lot of photographs um, of the veterans gathered around the monument and they've probably just enjoyed a speech by their colonel or some surviving 
senior ranking officer um, to talk about it. Yeah. Thank you well, so much for coming. This is absolutely fascinating. <laughs> it's an honor.